Hello, and welcome to the Genius of Information, featuring Genius 100 visionary Richard Saul Warman. I'm Hilary Viner, CEO of Genius 100 Foundation, a global philanthropic community inspired by Einstein. On behalf of the extraordinary Genius 100 team, founder Rami Kleinman, global ambassador Ito Aharoni, and chief community officer Helen Hatzis, thank you so much for making the time to join us, either for the first time or again today. Genius 100 Foundation brings together accomplished, compassionate minds to reimagine the future and improve our world. We're a North American-based nonprofit whose purpose is to provide funds and support to under-resourced humanitarian and environmental initiatives and NGOs in geographies around the globe. We're delighted and honored to see so many members of our community and so many fans of our very special guest joining us from around the world today. And we want to give a special thank you to Genius of series sponsor, BST Canada and Ala Tanous, founding member of our community, president of Genius 100 Foundation Canada and global board member for your generous support. Now on to today's special event and a quick rundown of our program. Two extraordinary people from our community, Helen Hatzis and Genius 100 visionary, Richard Saul Werman will be in conversation. And here's where you come in. We will be fielding questions from the audience at the conclusion of the conversation. So please don't forget to submit questions via the Q&A option located in your Zoom panel. At the conclusion of the q and I'll be back to close things out and, and share some very special announcements. So thank you again for joining us today. And here's Helen. Thanks, Hillary. All right, everybody, we're in for a treat. What I love about G100 is that our community is filled with individuals who have shaped the way we live through you know, their brilliant discoveries, whether it be information architecture, which we're gonna get into in a moment, um, scientific discoveries uh, to prolong our health, or music, film, and literature that has moved us emotionally, um, becoming the soundtrack of our life, or simply coming up with string theory. Actually, I kid, but no, we do have a visionary who is the co-founder of String Theory. So we're amongst the giants and they exist in our time, our period of history. Richard Saul Werman is a master of the unexpected. And as a result of the interplay between his curiosity and ignorance, he has strived to simplify the complex. So he acknowledges that it stems from his desire to know rather than from already knowing and from his ignorance rather than from his intelligence and from his inability rather than his ability. And one of the many things that I have learned from the numerous conversations uh, with Richard is that he listens intently and he's also a wonderful storyteller. So without further ado, um, please welcome Richard Saul Werman. So Richard, I'm just, there you go. Hi. It's nice well, to Helen, see you. It's nice to see a, you. You got a few things wrong there, but I won't correct them because nobody <laughs> that hard. And they wouldn't know the difference. It's not from knowing to not know, but from not knowing to knowing, not knowing already. It's always from no. the zero no. place, not knowing. 100%. But go ahead, you start, you wanna ask me some questions and then we'll get into it. And occasionally I'll talk over what you say. Yeah, no worries. Okay, so I just wanted to ask you some rapid fire questions. And the first one is, where were you born? Philly. I'm from Philadelphia, North Philadelphia. Okay, what were you like as a kid? I was never a kid. Uh, I, I, am, I was the same as I am now. I, I never was a grown up. I mean, if it's a kid versus grown up, I never grew up. I mean, there was the way I am now, uh, sort of abrasively charming. Uh, I, I was when I was a kid. So I had a hard time when I was a kid. I had a hard time in my middle age. And when I got older and I wasn't threatening anybody, I, I, had, I have a more comfortable life. Okay. So then have you always been a curious person then? Yep. Yep. I don't know what, I don't know what life is without. It, it's a, it's a, it just, it's a somewhat interesting question, but I don't know what it would like I don't know what a day would be like if you didn't pull it apart and deconstruct it and put it together. 
-hmm. and having the magic of Googling, somebody says a word and you can Google it, you can find out things and you can yeah. take your trees anywhere you want. That to me is a day. I mean, a, a, a day is, 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 is always a day of discovery. You can start anywhere. It, yeah. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where a conversation starts. We were talking a little bit earlier. Well, I was talking a little bit with, with Hillary who did that little funny introduction uh, that uh, they pronounce her name wrong on the phone. So we could, we could have gone on and drifted away for about a half an hour. How, when you say your name, sometimes when I answer the phone, I say, Richard Saul Worman, they say Norman. And I don't know where people get Norman from, but yeah. Norman comes up. And I don't think it sounds that way, but other people do. And how much we don't hear in speech if we hear it not correctly. Not right. Correctly. And everybody speaks differently. That's the voice recognition programs are amazing. Siri is amazing to understand what you're saying. Oh gosh, uh, yeah. And, Siri and always prototype. butchers my name. Well, yeah. <laughs> the first have... prototype of, uh, uh, of Siri was uh, was shown at uh, at a TED that's conference. It. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It so was, who it was who called, is uh, 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 what was the ghost name? Something. It's a ghost in a movie. They always call a name something. The ghost. Anyway, it was called that to begin, and they couldn't use that because that was the name of. Ah, uh, I didn't know that. And then they called it something else. Yeah. Okay. Well, name. Uh, 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 Java was first called Oak, and that was introduced to Ted also, and uh, by Gosling, and uh, it was called Oak. And then when they finally came out with the product, they had it, they changed the name for some reason. Right. All right, I have another, another rapid uh, fire question for you here. Who is, was your mentor? Uh, I had a, 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 a one, one is mentored in different ways. Uh, that's why I called a conference I invented called EG, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, example of Gracia. By yeah. example, you have a mentor. You don't even have to know the mentor. Uh, Interesting. They, uh, it's commonly you think you do. You have to right. sit at the front of the mentor. Yeah. But no, I mean, there's people in history that are examples to me. If you really look into who they are, they're examples of sometimes one thing and sometimes another. They might not be nice people, and that's okay too. <laughs> it's not based on their loving you or their liking you even or knowing you. They right, can be right. an example of what you what uh, you can identify, what you can attach to it. So. Paul Clay, K L E E, that's not C L A Y, which is, mm -hmm. you could think. Uh, Paul Clay is a mentor of mine. I never met him. I could have just because he died when I was alive. When when I was alive when he when he died, um, and uh, I had a, another mentor at the University of Pennsylvania besides Lou Kahn, who was my major influence in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was Skylar Van Rensselaer Kamen. And he was a professor of Oriental studies and he was uh, encyclopedic. I, the only person I really knew that was encyclopedic. In, in wow. Almost very much, I've modeled my life. Uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, he was a brilliant man. I'm not a brilliant person at all. Uh, and uh, well, I'm not. Uh, that's not uh, kicking the dust either. It's, it, it looks like I'm smarter than I am. I know I look smart, but I'm not as smart as I look. That's phony <laughs> because. Uh, I'm so interested in things that it seems to people that I know all about them. No, no, I'm just grasping at straws and trying to learn about them. So my, my passion, you said the word compassionate when you gave your little talk about uh, the, the genius 100. I'm more passionate than compassionate. Uh, I know you're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to be more compassionate. It makes you nicer to be more. In a, in a coffee bar, you would say you're compassionate. I would never say that. Uh, I'm more just passionate to do good work, passionate to understand. Mm -hmm. Now, I think if you do good work and you have passion, it turns out it's also compassionate. Yeah. Because you're doing good work somehow you're, and you're trying to make help yourself understand so that other people can understand. But another word you used when you introduced me is the word simple. And I hate that word because simple, to simplify, and there's a simplification movement, they know what forms and everything. They take away things. Mm -hmm. And my idea is not simplify, it's to clarify. The work I do is very dense with information that you can understand. I don't make it less dense. I'm not trying to just 
you dumb it down so there's less words on a page. I'm right. trying to make them clear and have you find your own path to through them. And there's a sizable difference between simplification and clarification. And there is a simplification movement uh, that I particularly dislike. Okay. So what's my next fast question? Yeah, okay. You're in, okay. So which of your um, many achievements, and there are a lot, and I'm, you know, holding a couple of them here. I need two hands for the other one, I think. Oh, but, and, and all the, the books that you've published, you know, a hundred of them and the conferences that you've done about 40, is there one that stands out more than the next or are they like, I'll just, well, my, my answer to that, uh, I've danced around that an answer. That's, that's a question that people ask often of yeah. interviews. What's your favorite thing? What was your favorite speaker? What was your favorite this? What do you do? What was your favorite thing you've done? Yeah. Um, and that's a perfectly good question. I mean, it's something interesting in that. But I actually, I was walking around my my garden here at my house. And my garden is a hard garden. That's a new word I just invented today because I was explaining it to somebody. That it's a hard garden. It's not made of plants. It's made of, of I mean, it's, it's a marble, huge marble garden. And it has some columns in it. And it has about 10 of my bronze sculptures and two of somebody else's and and uh, uh, furniture and some great huge iron balls and some square uh, 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 cubes of, of uh, stainless steel. So it's a hard garden, but it's a garden. Yeah. Um, and I was looking at some of my sculptures out there because when actually when I finished them, oh, I would say within a few days or a week of just loving them, I look at them, all of a sudden it clicks differently. And I look at them and I, I look at them as a visitor and I wonder who did it. I have no attachment to it whatsoever. Mm. Uh, uh, I don't really care about them in, as far as identifying with it. Uh, but there's some I don't like and there's some I really like. And I thought, boy, he, you know, that's pretty good. But I don't, it's not a self compliment anymore. And so what is my favorite thing is the, the painting or the sculpture or the meeting or the gathering or the idea or whatever, or the tree that I think of, tree not meaning a, an, an organic tree, but a tree of, of how to organize information. Uh, it's the next one that I haven't thought of as my favorite because mm. it will be my favorite for a while uh, unless I really don't like it or think it's going a different direction. And I might finish it, not think it's so good. But while I'm doing it, my enthusiasm is, and it's my favorite. But the ones I've done are interesting examples for me of what somebody has done, but I don't have the attachment. And if I look at them, it looks like, if you look at, it seems because I have them on my walls, uh, that I'm attached to them, but now I have the few that I really like where I like them and the others are not as good. And I'm judging them as I would have bought the paintings. I couldn't afford them if I was buying them. So yeah, it's, it's, I, that, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. No, it, it does. It really, it's always looking in the future is, yeah. is, is passion. And it's interesting. Lucan, in Lucan said that, that one of the greatest of human emotions is, is, is anticipation. And, uh, and you know, when you anticipate meeting somebody or seeing something there's sometimes a, once it starts it's not as not not does it, the flush is off of it yeah because the anticipation was the great emotion about it <laughs> yeah. yeah uh sometimes yeah. it stays sometimes it stays so I, i'm gonna ask you a little bit about uh lucon but um just to backtrack so people know you as the founder of ted and are curious about how you got that started but i'm not going to ask you that because you've, like we've talked about, you've done so much before and after that. Um, and I feel that like when we get through this conversation, I think people have a better understanding um, as to why you started, you know, why you created TED. So my question, uh, my quest <laughs> to inform our audience is you studied, you know, under the renowned architect, um, Lou Kahn, who you just briefly spoke about while you were at the University of Pennsylvania. So what is it? that you admire, like what did you admire and respect in him so much that he became your mentor? 
Um, one of the taglines in many of his speeches and in the way he worked was to differentiate the measurable from the immeasurable. Okay. So what I liked about him is immeasurable, it's hard to tell you about it. Mm -hmm. Not just the, that he was smart or that he was facile. Uh, he was smart, he wasn't, there's smarter people than Lou. There's people certainly with more facility than Lou, but there's nobody like Lou. And uh, I am not alone at all, but the people he touched, uh, even if you, if I meet somebody who said they studied under Lou, automatically that's enough. Uh, we have something in common. There's a bond mm -hmm. of an attitude uh, in the service of architecture. Uh, and it's architecture in the broadest sense. It's not a definition of somebody who builds a building. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there in government, there's an architect of foreign policy. Jefferson was called the architect of foreign policy. Uh, you can be the architect of something. The way a map is not just of, of a land, you can map your emotions, you can map your feelings, you can map how a company does over 10 years in a chart. That's a map of something. Mm -hmm. It's a spatial, that, and that's information architecture. Yeah. Lou, Lou told the truth. And he said things uh, that I hadn't heard before, every, virtually every time I spoke with him. Wow. They had a clarity about him. He used the word dumb a lot. I used the word ignorant or stupid a lot mm -hmm. as a compliment because it's, it's, it's a before the beginning word. Yeah. It's how you start something, which is you're dumb about it. It's so good it's dumb when you get to the conclusion. Yeah. You can't change anything. It's just, it's, <laughs> it's the positive use of a word that often is, is pejorative. And he, uh, a little later in the talk, like right now, I'll talk about opposites. That mm -hmm. often things yeah. that are, that clarify or that uh, innovate uh, or are, are often the opposite of of what you've uh, of what you've thought. Uh, in the in a very simplistic glib way, Jonas Salk, who uh, discovered the Salk, I mean, did the Salk vaccine for polio. Uh, one of his he used dead virus, dead, the, he, his viruses that he used as injections were dead, not live. Mm -hmm. That was a big deal because most people in the United States and the world, the world, uh, the next virus, the next invention, like this Pfizer and, and other people who did the, the things we get now uh, for uh, COVID, uh, they're slightly different. So you invent those. And the next person that invented something for polio was Sabin. And they, people got the Sabin vaccine because it was cheaper. And uh, uh, so, but we used live viruses. And that's why if everybody had gotten the salt inoculation, the claim is that there would be no polio in the world. But because people did get the live vaccine, there is still live polio in, that, in these vaccines and around the world. So there's some cases still in places of polio. Um, there's everything uh, 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 you brought up Einstein. Uh, Einstein had somebody that uh, he uh, had vicious uh, debates with, uh, who also got a Nobel Prize, um, Niels Bohr, uh, who was from Copenhagen, Danish. And he was a good friend of Einstein's, respected him. Einstein respected him, but they didn't agree because. Niels Bohr was involved with quantum mechanics and called quantum physics, and, and Einstein famously didn't mm -hmm. think that was the way to go. When he, did, got his, when he got his Nobel Prize, Niels Bohr said, when I have a profound idea, I believe the opposite is also profound. Well, that's amazing. That is. That's an amazing statement. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the dances we love, uh, we all love, and it's, it, it flourishes a little bit here and there around the world continuously since uh, 
it was uh, first uh, devised, the music and the dance, by Carlos Gardel in Argentina, who died in 1935, um, is the tango. And that is a dance. You can picture it in your mind now. You can almost sway because you understand the music of it. Mm -hmm. uh, is a dance of opposites. It's about love and hate. It's about embracing people and touching them and standing away from them. The resistance. It's about improvisation and various special rules. It's all about opposites. Mm -hmm. You touch and you don't touch at all. It's an amazing, and it can be two men and two women. Yeah. So it is a dance, the music going with the dance of opposites. And uh, in the opposite of things is a great adventure. So Lou was the opposite uh, of any person I had ever met. He wasn't, he was, he, he served architecture is what he said. I'm in the service. And he made the inanimate adamant. He was laughed at because he talked about him talking to bricks. I asked the brick what it wanted to be mm -hmm. about the existence will of inanimate objects. And he made everything animate, animate. So it was like, he gave life to everything in the world. And he spoke to them. He had conversations with them. And we're having a conversations now. Mm -hmm. Now, you're not a brick, but you wouldn't have to say anything and we could still talk. I could just talk. And it would be a more interesting presentation of information if it, if it was in this conversation form than somebody behind a lectern with a speech reading it and being a caption for slides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it has that reaction and reaction of and tension and you shaking your head which if you were in india you would go the other way mm. and that's the opposite of what we do yeah. there's yeah. little opposites in in the mudra of how we use our bodies mm -hmm. and how cultures are different and how we speak and the power in japan of silence you go to a meeting in japan there's long times of silence mm -hmm go to a meeting in America, they're just talking over each other. They think power comes from claiming the floor. And in Japan, often the power comes from the superiority of listening. We have, when we have, I mean, we've had many conversations and I've shared with people, there's times where we just have that, you know, very long pause. Yeah. For whatever reason, we're contemplating, we're just, digesting uh I've, in, I've given a lot of speeches and occasionally it's manipulative but occasionally uh i'll be i won't say anything and i know they think because i'm old i'm 87 or uh, whatever i am that oh he's you know the dribble's going to come down the chin we're here to see it uh and <laughs> they're they're leaning forward And then I speak. Wow. And the atmosphere in a room when you're silent is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Nobody else I'd get on with it or something like that. It doesn't happen. <laughs> but so, you did, can I just say, uh, Ted, you did stand at the side of the stage ready to pull someone off if necessary. No, I didn't stand. I sat. I sat. Oh, you, oh, you sat. Seat. Okay. Oh, no, I wouldn't stand that long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a, it's not very good for the the plantain muscles in your feet yeah i stood through the whole uh conference i got a, a a case of the whatever that uh feet going bad and because uh, you're standing too much right. now, standing is not a, a natural position of the human being uh and if you just stand i stood at the conference i did in kobe japan for four days, because uh, um, for some reason I did, I was doing that. And at the end of the conference, I could hardly walk. Mm. But I did sit there and I watched the audience. And I could sense in the audience whether uh, the person, it was a way of, for me of learning about what, how you understand and what you understand. Are you swayed by a good speaker or by good information that you mm -hmm. understand? 
uh, Lou was not a really good speaker, but gave marvelous presentations. I mean, you just hung on his word. Hmm. He paused, he lost his way, and you were there with him. You were, he was learning as he was talking and he was finding where to go. So he wasn't slick. I never tried to get a slick speaker. You never try to get a good speaker. Mm, good true. speaker that gives a pat talk. Uh, they give their 35 minute and I can, I, I had a couple of times, uh, I had a, a couple of speakers one year because it was, it was a TED on, on, um, on selling, on, TED on how you sell an idea, how you make something happen. And I had two gentlemen who gave, the top people got very big fees, not from TED, but they got big fees off and they wanted to speak there. Um, and they both gave just slick 35 minute speeches. And the second one, they booed the audience. Oh, wow. Because it was just a slick speech. It, it was what they got paid to do. They couldn't, and I warned them, both of them. I said, just, there's no lectern. You can't read a speech. Don't give a memorized speech. Just talk about what's on your mind that day. And just don't be a caption in front of your slides. And uh, that's a hard lesson to learn because often people are terrified of speaking with those, without those crutches. Oh, for sure. So one of the things, I don't want to talk about TED much. Yeah. It'll come up when we talk about innovation because mm -hmm. TED, like the Bauhaus movement, one of the innovations was subtraction. I took away the lecture. I took away a dress code. Uh, I took away saving seats for the sponsors or for the speakers. Mm -hmm. I took away uh, having one subject as the as the uh, you know that the conference was called one thing, and you only talked about eye, ear, nose, and throat, and you only talked about noses one year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you speeches were about or presentations were about whatever they were, and I asked people. Uh, as much as I cure, and they and you couldn't rehearse, and I I asked the presenters to um, say something perhaps you haven't said before, just talk to the audience, and uh, don't just give your twenty five minute speech, and virtually everyone who did that gave a better speech, not everyone. Mm -hmm. But all the ones that had prepared speech, prepared speeches, except some stars that people like because they saw them and don't listen to anything they say, uh, we're just, it's just, you never feel connected. You know that they've said this before. Yeah. So you've uh, been doing this intellectual jazz thing before you even gave it a name. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about intellectual jazz? Because I think the first time you really use that phrase was at your conference www is that right yeah yeah but uh that uh that was but ted in good moments was that and yeah my life has always been that i just figured out that name i like naming things yeah like it's a, great pairing a, of words you know uh, uh, uh example of Rashi for the eg conference mm -hmm. it was basically a gathering as people showing examples of things and that, that's what EG means in a letter or something. Here's an example. Yeah. Uh, Intellectual Jazz was a conference that was given um, in Redlands, California uh, at the uh, Esri offices. Uh, the owner of Esri is an amazing, amazing man, Jack Dangermont. I wonder if it's Jack is out there. There's a call out to Jack if Jack's watching. <laughs> Jack. And if he's not out there, somebody call Jack and tell him I tell uh, tell his sec secretary that I called out to him. He owns Esri, which is the largest maker of, of uh, program for mapping in the world. And he has a beautiful uh, uh, auditorium uh, in a strange town, Redlands, is a couple hours away from LA. Mm -hmm. And I did this conference where I just looked at 50 of the people who are the most special 
or they were of the most special. You know, let's say there was 100 that was most special and of those, 50 of them came. Uh, really incredible people, uh, Yo-Yo Ma and, and Will I Am and David Blaine and- and uh, Frank Gehry. Frank Gehry, Moshe Zafti, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and doctors and uh, uh, dancers and uh, scientists and a uh, person ahead of this uh, came from CERN and somebody uh, in physics and somebody who was managing and running the uh, Juno mission to Jupiter from, from all things. And they didn't know who they were going to talk with. And they... Uh, they might know them, but they probably didn't do the same thing. And they sat facing each other, not the audience. And I just started them. I didn't even introduce them. And I let them just begin a conversation with each other. They forgot the audience was there. <laughs> and uh, they just talked to each other. And at a certain time, I said, I think that's enough. And we get two more people up. And it started with me, I started doing the, the gathering by calling up Yo-Yo. And in the conversation, I said, there's somebody you would like to talk with. Wow. And um, there was. And I said, are you free the next, sometime in the next year for about three or four days? I'm not asking you to do anything. And this is not an invitation. Is there any free time? Just give me the date. So he gave me a week, about a year away. I said, we'll see. And uh, I put down the phone, called up this uh, person. And I said, I was just talking to Yo-Yo uh, and he'd love to have a conversation with you. You have this date free. And that's how I started filling the room with wow. speakers. <laughs> that's cool. That is so cool. <laughs> and they so had we... never met before. He'd never gotten to speak with these. Never. He was, no. So he met up there and they had a conversation. I think that's great. And you lent us the... Um idea of intellectual jazz at our very first G100 summit in Kabul, which was fantastic. It really set the tone um, to allow people to just freely talk about whatever they want and not have the, you know, the typical gathering or conference. Okay, I wanna ask you about information architecture, because mm -hmm. this is really interesting. So it's been around since, from what I understand, since the beginning of print and architecture, but it was you who coined the term Information. Oh, information all through the through a long you can go back hundreds of years and people tried yeah. to make things understandable they didn't, okay. have, they didn't have a name for it and they didn't have different disciplines that could be involved right and it wasn't uh it wasn't a uh, a coherent path and and uh, and uh uh discipline mm -hmm. uh that had any rules or guidelines to it uh and it's not just graphic design. Uh, you should have a building that talks to you, I, you know, you, that tells you how to go through it. Yeah. When you go to an airport, it's a plethora of signs, but the building itself, if it was designed well, you would know where to walk. It could talk to you. Everything doesn't have to be in a sign. Your environment can talk to you, and a book can talk to you, mm -hmm. and an annual report can talk to you. <laughs> And a conversation can talk to you in ways that you can understand. And if, when you call it information design, design, and a lot of people call themselves information designers, but it conjures up in people's mind aesthetics because design has aesthetic aesthetics. There's no aesthetics to information architecture. Architecture is a, is a, a discipline. It, has, it, it, it might be a beautiful building, but it's not primarily aesthetics. It's it's solving a problem that's clear. And if it's a lousy, it might be a beautiful object, but a lousy building. But it's a lousy building. It's no good. I mean, it, it, it's it, it, you're not. It's not a piece of sculpture that yeah. you walk through. So uh, I just put together. I'm trained in architecture, and I have my master's uh, basic and, and master's degree in architecture from Penn, under Luke, and. Uh, and I, my advantage over you and my advantage over most all that I meet is that I understand more clearly, I understand what it's like not to understand. <laughs> so I have more power than you do because 
I can see the blank slate and it's not pre-filled uh, and I don't have a recipe. Wow. But I have a responsibility to clarify. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't start in that fork of the road of looking good or being good. I don't do the looking good fork. I do the being good fork. Yeah. And often graphic designers, architects, are, are, and other people, people, human beings, often try to look good rather than be good. Yeah. So you came up with this concept in like 1975 and it was- No, no, I, long before that, I just, I was asked to be national chairman of the AIA conference, American Institute of Architects. Okay. So I was the national chairman. So I was king uh, to run this conference of 5,000 people. And I had to name it and I ran it and I was chair of it. So yeah. I thought, well, I'll call it the architecture of information and create, I'll give something to the, uh, to what I've been spewing about before that, mm -hmm. well before that, in 62, I did a book uh, in, uh, in North Carolina of the plans, uh, had uh, uh, plasticine models built, uh, uh, sketch models of 50 cities in the world all to the same scale. So you could see which was, uh, Paris is this big, Rome is only this big, some are only this big, yeah. cities you know, and you had no idea the size of them. Yeah. How big is a whale? Is it bigger than an elephant? Oh my God, it's bigger than about 40 elephants. I mean, it's so big. A whale is so big. <laughs> it's, it's A whale is as long as, as, as an Olympic swimming pool. Mm -hmm. Its tongue is like the size of a Volkswagen uh, or its heart. Uh, you know, the ventricles of the heart you can walk through. It's just, but you only know that relative to something you understand. Yeah. So one of my first laws is that you, you can only understand something relative to something you understand. So when architects take photos of buildings without people in it, you really don't know how big it is. Mm. And they always do it because it looks good. They clean up things, right? Yeah. Uh, so my journey is a different journey. And I'm not asking anybody else to do it. I'm just saying it's what I do. I'm not, I'm not trying to have a line of people behind me or start a school or bring this into everybody's life. It's just in my life. It's the only life I live. Yeah, but and just those two words have impacted so many people. Like I've seen a lot of, well, when I, when I first did the architecture of information, I had, I remember the AIA architects in uh, Texas sent me nasty letters saying, you're not allowed to use the word architecture in anything except uh, AI. It was silly. Yeah. And then there was a bunch of information designers thinking, what are you going to do? Charge to use that word? Uh, there was, a, and it was because wow. it, it was something different. And I was putting the, res it's a word of responsibility. Uh, it's not design mm -hmm. where you're just responsible to make something please a client or it's not measurable except by pleasuring somebody. Um, and this had the responsibility of that an architect has when they build a building that it stands up, that it's good for a purpose. It has something to fall back on. And that's the only reason, the only word I could think of, which was touch me and touch uh, this passion that I have mm -hmm. to clarify things I don't understand. My, my, the glib story of what it, where I come from, and I've told this story before, so I'm telling you, you might've heard it before, somebody watching, but it's a good story. Um, is a, a woman goes to Santa Fe and uh, is amazed by some of the food products that the Indians and the Spanish culture and the Native American Indians and the, pe the people, just Americans who have come through and all the foods that were unique there, that were put together and she created this Southwestern kind of, it's not kind of, a Southwestern restaurant mm -hmm. that did very well. And uh, you know, the potato chips that were blue and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody else comes through, the, this is not a true story. Uh, somebody else uh, comes through the city and uh, goes into a restaurant and says, wow, this is fantastic. Now she goes to New York and she gets a big advance to do a book on Southwestern cooking. 
because she's done it. She has it all there. She has the recipe. She has the food. She has the success. He goes to the same publisher and says, I would like a big advance to do a Southwestern cookbook. And they throw him out because he said, I'm doing it because I want to learn about it. And that my journey in this cookbook will be the journey from not knowing to knowing. Will be my learning about what it is from zero to what it is. Wow. Now, I've done a number of books on, on medicine. I did a book uh, on uh, understanding healthcare. And I didn't use one doctor for the book because they, they don't explain things. I never had a doctor explain anything that I could understand. So the people I used had to learn about all the different graphic designers and writers had to learn from zero and explain it so they understood it. And if they understood it, and the people who got the book understood it. Before it came out, it was checked by a, a gold list of doctors to make sure it was okay. And to see if there was anything wrong, came through fine and never have had one letter on a medical book. I haven't had one letter come in that somebody said you didn't write enough about headaches. I mean, I didn't have any letters about, about the book. Okay. Uh, but it, it was out there, everybody's listening. Is selling their expertise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I sell my ignorance. <laughs> no, I'm Good. serious. No, no, fair enough. My fair experience enough. and my passion. You, you're going to go job swipping, and you're going to get another job sometime. And you'll come in, and you'll tell them what you can do. Mm -hmm. And that's the last thing I would tell them is what I can do. It's what I would like to learn about. And I would, you could come along with me on this journey, and it would be fresh, yeah, and clear. Because I'm pretty dumb, and if I can understand it, a lot of other people can too. And I'm well, serious about that. Yeah, I know you're yeah. laughing at it, and I'm, I'm, it's not a funny thing I'm saying, even though it's making you laugh. It's <laughs> making you laugh because it's the opposite of what people do. Yeah, yeah. No, it's I the opposite know. of what you're taught to do. I find it delightful. Your, that's why. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, write up your curriculum vitae. Mm -hmm. Write up things that are you're proud of and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I'm, 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 I'm just as I've learned, you've learned just as much from your failures. Oh, I agree. Yeah. They, they, uh, I'm going to give you two words uh, because I have people's attention, maybe, because we've talked about opposites. But yeah. that's one of the five ways you can innovate. And I like to see the boundaries of things within which I work and then have freedom from that. Right. Happy constraints, happy limitations, but good limitations. Mm -hmm. So I invented an acronym called A, A, NOSE, N-O-S-E. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has five letters. And I invented another one called LATCH, mm -hmm. L-A-T-C-H. LATCH stands for the five ways you can organize information. The other is the five ways you can, you can innovate. Yep. And uh, I have some other ones. And these are what I build, gives me comfort to begin any project and think about everything, is to yep. run past my my little uh, organizational chart and work within that and let them explode or attach themselves to each other. Can you tell us LATCH, what it stands for? L-A-T-C-H is um, uh, location, uh, alphabet, time, category, and hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And a nose? Um, add, opposites, subtraction, and uh, what's the last word? Epiphany? Epiphany, yeah. Yeah, and I think need yeah. is in there too, right? And well, need, yeah, N-E. Yeah, yeah. And epiphany, which is the loose cannon, is somebody who comes up with the idea or even sometimes in my life, coming up with an idea that nobody, nobody wants, needs, or has thought about. Mm -hmm. It's like a, uh, somebody at 3M finds he has some glue and it doesn't stick, and, and he invents the post-it note. Because uh, it was a glue that never got hard, never stuck, but yeah. it was perfect for a post-it note. That's where they came out with the post-it note. Yeah. There are things that come out that people invent that are 
epiphanies. They just see something in something that nobody else saw. It doesn't make them brilliant. It just meant they saw it. They had an epiphany about it. Uh, they're not necessarily a genius. <laughs> um, and uh, But the other ones, subtraction. In, in TED, one of the, the use of subtraction was I got, did away with the lectern, yeah. did away with those, did away with all those things. That was subtraction. Mm -hmm. My iPhone is addition. There's about 100 different technologies from different people. They didn't invent the maps, the mapping system. They bought a company that did that. Yeah. They, they didn't invent all those things. Uh, they added them together and they packaged them. So sometimes, I mean, uh, General Motors didn't invent the camera on the back of the car so you see who you run over when you back up uh that's supposed to be funny yeah, I, know. Um, <laughs> I was like uh, run over people <laughs> well but they didn't invent that camera they added it onto their yeah into what they were doing mm -hmm. so um there's uh uh a lot of things in it at, at ted uh, and some things in my books are not about uh, aesthetics, and they're not about success or making more money or having more people. Mm -hmm. It's about the quality of, of the product of, of what you learn. Yeah, Latch has really helped me because it's it's a really powerful acronym. Again, location, alphabet, time, category, hierarchy, and that's I think you've said to me in the past that's the like basically the five ways you organize things. And I know well people use it. People use yeah, it. People so use it. They use it. They don't know who did it, who came up with it. It's People, this guy right here, right, right yeah, there. No, but I'm, I'm saying it's, yeah. it's it's just uh, it's in the ether. As soon as I did yeah. it, it was gone. And that's that's amazing. You just let it go. Yeah. It but I love go. a nose because that when you introduced that concept to me, um, you know, you said that you also believe that there's only five ways to innovate. So I always think of. Well, the, all these there's all, so many people talking about innovation, and they're yeah. not they're not developing a tree that is understandable of their choices, yeah, or the combination of choices, and it just it, it, it gives you peace when you have that because it takes away the anxiety of of thinking of how to begin. So I have a I have another question for you. Um, in the past, you've been asked. Um, this was like in a previous interview. Do you think that your hunger for knowledge will ever be satiated? And in our conversation a couple of weeks ago, you said this great line, and I was like, "Stop! I got to write this down." And even though you say, "No, listen and write notes later," I had to write it down because I it was just it was so great. And you said something about surviving your ambitions. I love that line. Do you feel that you've survived your ambitions? Um. I've had a more interesting life than I thought I would, uh, but I have black holes in my stomach, unfulfilled and never will be fulfilled. I had things I wanted to do that I didn't get to do and it's too late for me to do. So it's not that, uh, uh, and I don't measure success by dollars. See success in our world is, is, is success and the word more go together whether it's more dollars or more people at a conference or more of something. Yeah. And mine is whether I, it was, it's interesting whether I say, oh, ah, or, or, hmm, <laughs> is, 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 is more flavorful. And uh, I've been granted permission somehow to survive being gainfully unemployed. Uh, I have a, uh, I, I, I don't work for anybody. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I would like to, but nobody asks me to do anything. I've never been asked to do a book. Yeah. I've done 100 books. I've never been asked to do a conference. You would think somebody would ask me to do that. You would think somebody would ask me to be on their board. And you would think somebody would ask me to do a conference. But nobody's asked me to do those things. Uh, I guess that's part of my abrasive. Not They haven't got through to my charm yet. Um, <laughs> And so anything I've created, I've had to think up myself and get it done. So I don't have a publisher. I don't have a publicist. I don't have an agent. And uh, I'm below the radar. Uh, but it's, 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 uh, 
it's, would I like to be above it? Sure. Sometimes I, I think of that and it would just fuck me over. It would just screw with me. Right. Uh, and um, I know that. And uh, so you, you've been to visit. We don't see people yeah. <laughs> very much. Yeah. We live uh, off the grid pleasurably uh, north of Miami, you know, wow. in Florida. What an impact you've made for someone who is, you know, you consider yourself, you know, under the radar. Huge impact, Richard, huge. Well, I think because it makes sense. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, the things are palatable and digestible without, you don't have to know who thought them up or yeah. who did them because they work. So yeah. I don't copyright my books or if anybody wants to use any of them, they can. Uh, because why? <laughs> I've done it. And wow. it's not more, it's not more about selling more books. I don't reprint my books. They go out of print. So if you go online, you'll see there's a number that you, some of them people like yeah. and sell for a lot of money on eBay. I had a book that was selling for hundreds of thousands. Yeah, I, understanding, understanding is selling for a pretty penny. Yeah, understanding, understanding is selling for a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. I was now and it came, you know. I'm going to pick it up again. This, I'm, it's not, this is how I get my daily work. I wouldn't, I would, if I was selling it, I wouldn't sell it no. for 250 bucks. Yeah, I love this book. Yeah, I like that book too. Uh, yeah, I, it's, I pick it's, it up and look at it. It's fun to look at. Yeah, it's close by. Yeah. And I'm so grateful for your friend, uh, Dan Klein, from the Understanding Group, who is taking all of the work that you've done and he's archiving it so that future yeah. generations. It'll be an archive, yeah. Yeah, we're I think that's. Figuring out where to, we're figuring yeah, out where yeah. to put the archive, but there'll be an archive of, 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 uh, of all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, but you, you can. I've been asked by sometimes young people, usually young people, because older people don't talk to me. But uh, uh, the young people say, "How do you get? I have an idea for a great idea for a book. How do you get it published? You know, who? Yeah. You know, how do you get? The, how do you do?" It? I said, "Well, I have a secret. And I, I can't tell you." So they keep on asking. <laughs> That's After perfect. Them, I'll tell you, but don't tell anybody else. Yeah. The secret is. I want to do it so badly. Wow. And that's my secret to each thing I do. Yeah. I just want to do it so badly. And some of them I get done. Uh -huh. And I've got enough done. You know, I mean, it's enough. Like my 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 new idea for getting a Nobel Prize in economics is is called enough plus a dollar. That that should be what everybody makes in the whole world. Yeah. But no more. But no more. Plus a dollar. That's no amazing. That. So, Everything more than that, you get a medal you can put on your chest. Yeah. <laughs> For every million or 10 million or a hundred million dollars, you get a different medal. <laughs> different you, don't make, you, you, you just don't, and it's like a Russian general, but it, it's, you don't get more, you get enough. And yeah. determined on your kind of a measure of your lifestyle based on things you've done and that's it. And uh, it can't be done. I, you never could figure that out, but it's the idea of it that, for me, the idea that that's what, all we need. And it's the same way in, I think in that, in that book you held up, I have a, one little, I have a little drawing I put in there of an, a little armband, the way the Jews had to wear armbands, yellow armband, yeah. uh, 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 to say they were Jewish in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. um, and I say, I said, all the senators and people in the House of Representatives should wear an armband, and on it should be written "briber," <laughs> um, because I love it. Everybody is given money. People who are serving us are paid by other people to, and every one of them, every we all know that this is done. Oh we all God. know that they see everybody. We all yeah. know that they're being bribed in one way or the other. Not necessarily by it could be, it could be ostentatious, and they travel in somebody's private plane. But it, and it could be money for their campaign. But it's all a bribe. You know, whatever it is, it's a bribe for influence. I there's a photo, and I have to I'll have to source it out. I saw it like I don't know when I saw it. It was a while ago, but it was politicians in like these NASCAR outfits, and it had all the all their corporations. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was well, we brilliant. Never, 
But but nobody says that they're primary because that's a yeah. that's a pejorative. Yeah. But to be honest, I mean, you can say sponsored by somebody. So if there's a big enough sponsor, probably you might. I'm not saying you do or you might, but you could. They could get somebody on your on this program, right? Yeah, we do. Yeah. At, when I ran the TED conference, I had some sponsors to uh, to do a meal, a dinner. Mm -hmm. But no sponsor got to speak. And they couldn't get to speak. And they couldn't get my mailing list. Uh, and they and I didn't save a seat for them if they came. Wow. Uh, well, whatever, yeah. And I never took cash. Um, and I ran it fine. It's run differently now, but it's a different, it's a different thing and a marvelous thing now, but it's just quite different. Uh, and Chris Anderson's done an amazing job of what he's done to bring it out in the world. Um, and uh, I could never have done that and wouldn't have wanted my life to be that. Yeah. But uh, I think the best conference I did was the one I described to you that I did at Esri, mm -hmm. uh, where there was a celebration of conversation, a celebration of sharing ideas and allowing E.O. Wilson, who unfortunately passed away recently, uh, last year or so, who was the greatest biologist in the world at that time, at his death, who specialized in ants and bees and things. At the end of his uh, talk, this conversation, he got up and he said, oh, I wanted to, forgot to tell you this. And he did talk to the audience. He said, just a couple of days ago, and that's the first time I'm talking about it, I came up, and there's a paraphrase, of course, but he's not alive to catch me on it. Um, but there is a tape. Um, uh, I realized that the whole colony of ants is one animal. Mm that it's just the queen and all the ants are just one animal. And um, I thought that was amazing. So he said something for the first time there, which was terrific. And it came out of permission to be free and to talk and having a conversation with uh, the person who sequenced the human genome for the first time. So wow. was it that level it, it, it's just, it's very exciting. That is exciting. When I ran the Aspen conference one year in 72, mm -hmm. uh, Lou Kahn was one of the speakers and that had 1200 people in and Aspen, the IDCA, International Design Conference in Aspen. Yeah. In its day, particularly some middle years, four or five middle years, it was the best conference in the world for sure. Uh, now, one of the best conferences in the world is one done in Germany called Falling Walls, which is done on the anniversary in Berlin, the anniversary of the walls falling. Yeah. It's also the same date as Glashnik, that when they broke, broke all the shop windows of the, of the Jewish shops in Berlin or in, in Munich. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very good scientific conference, but it's, it's also broad and it's, 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 it's an amazing conference. Um, well, ask me another question. You know what I want? Thanks, Richard. I wanted to ask you, because um, I haven't seen you in person since COVID. And, um, you know, coming out of COVID, we're slowly coming out of it. Many of people, you know, they're always saying, oh, the world has changed. Not so COVID. Is a, it's a, world has, COVID changed the world, but we're not out of COVID. No, uh, I know. We're not out. But, but no, we're, it, we're out of it being reported in the newspapers. And yeah, but it's still happening. Right. No, it's, it's, yes. This is, this, I grew up during polio and every day it didn't kill a million, well, it killed maybe a million people, but it was, uh, it, it attacked mostly young people. Mm -hmm. So it was a feared thing because young people are closer to our, to our hearts. Yeah. Young people always are. Uh, young people and dogs are the, what we cry about. Um, and uh, every day in the newspaper, they would tell you the cases. Yeah. Nationally, internationally, the same way they did with COVID. 
the same way they did with the flu when it was a, was a big thing. Now that you don't hear about the flu, now we don't hear about COVID, there'll be a story of monkey, whatever the monkey flu thing monkey is. Monkey pox, yeah. Monkey pox. Mm -hmm. But that's all, it's not killing enough people, so we, it's off their list and we're not conscious of it. So it's what's ever uh, important of the day is what we see and what we have to digest. That's our limitations. That's the menu we're given. Yeah. Is, sorry, we don't have eggs in the kitchen. We can't make you eggs. Yeah. You can't find out about it. Uh, so COVID, is, COVID still is killing many people. And I, I, would, I would not go to a, uh, to a dense meeting of people. And I wouldn't go on a dense cruise ship or a sporting event or something that was people to do. I would now because of my age, but because it's still around. Yeah. And you're just hearing, we're still hearing, aren't you hearing of people who got it? Yeah. I am. Yeah. I'm hearing about that. I'm not hearing less than I did before during the height of the, of, of all the, 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 the uh, you know, the panic over it. I saw the numbers in the newspaper that felt you felt like the person next door has it. Mm -hmm. uh, but of people I know, I didn't. I knew some people who got it then. <laughs> some people are getting it now. Getting it again and again. And, yeah. and getting it again. And I just talked to a, a friend of mine whose wife, they're wealthy people, and his wife is at a spa isolated in Spain. And she had gotten it in, in uh, Hong Kong at the very beginning of COVID. She's had it for two years. Mm. And just this long thing. Yeah. So it's it's out of sight out of mind and this is out of our sight because it's, there's never been, there hasn't been a story on tv about it in my memory <laughs> i mean in the last yeah. month that i've seen recent yeah yeah 100%. And, and yet it's still something that i think about i don't think about it in the same way because i'm not flooded with those reminders of the hospital yeah. rooms yeah but there's still a lot of it and we still don't know a lot about it and we don't know about the next one so I hear what you're saying, that, uh, but you have to know, we, we are conscious of today's events and there is no long-term, like there's long-term COVID, there's no long-term memory. You know, the prime minister's story in, in Great Britain will be okay till there's another prime minister, yeah. but it's, gonna be, it's not gonna be replaced unless, uh, as long as, as, as the war is going on, uh, and uh, until the next war or until the next serious uh, multiple shooting. And, you know, that's, that's what we, that's what gets eyeballs on your television. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to wrap it up in a, in a moment, but I wanted to share some questions that we got from local school kids here in my city, sorry, my neighborhood. And they're between the ages of five and eleven, and I, uh, I just find okay. these questions. I just I, find kids. I, I promise. I don't want to promise I'll be good at this. I'm not. Okay. Used to no, it. that's okay. Um, so Matthew, who's uh, five years old, asked, mm -hmm. "What did you want to be when you were a kid?" <laughs> okay, I think he means when you're older. But when you were a kid, what did you want to be? Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted for uh, right up until uh, just before I graduated high school. I wanted to be an artist. I always wanted to be an artist, and uh, and all through high school, and and then I liked getting things printed. I liked going to printing places and getting things printed. And my father arranged for me to go to various printing places, and I saw that. And I went to in high school. I went to Temple University as an art school, a very good one called uh, Stella Elkins Tyler School of Fine Arts. I went there. My father got me as a kid in high school into there for summer uh, programs with all these grown-ups, you know, a lot of people coming back from the war with uh, uh, those things, because I'm 87, so it was talking about the first world war. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, second world war, sorry. And um, I went to night school at Temple. So I wanted to be an artist. And then as I took a series of tests and my proclivities or the abilities or my passions were art, obviously. Uh, architecture uh, and ar archaeology and hairdressing. And um, so, um, wow. 
I went to a, a, a deep, deep uh, set of tests for a whole day. Yeah. And I decided plan that I could, if I went into any of those but architecture, I couldn't move out of them. In other words, I couldn't move from painting to archaeology. Mm. I couldn't move from hairdressing anywhere. I, the only one that allowed me from architecture, I could move into be a painter. I could be an archaeologist. And I decided to cut my own hair. And uh, so I haven't been to a barber since then. Uh, and my hair is just long and I cut it off just with a funny series of scissors by hand there. So it's scraggly in the back, but, and, uh, and I washed it this morning. So it's nice and white. Um, so that's what I wanted to be. Amazing. I, to be, I, to be I think so, Matthew, I, cause I didn't know that about you. So that's, that's great. So um, there's time. I am, painting. I am painting. I just had a show. I know. Uh, I love your painting. So I, ha I had a, a show of my paintings. And I did, so this is, COVID, was, the gift that COVID gave me was I couldn't get frames for my paintings. So I said, well, I have to do something else. So I said, I can get plasticine delivered by, by a truck, you know, because you get, we're getting those services. Yeah. So uh, I, um, I got plasticine and I started doing sculpture. And then I did uh, some sculpture and I, got it cast into bronze. So I learned more about bronze casting. Casting Sir Purdue is a great caster in town. I was there the day before yesterday mm -hmm. and picked up two new ones. And so I have about 30 bronze sculptures in my hard garden here. Yep. And I like sculpture. Now I've stopped painting and I'm just doing sculpture. I just like sculptures, doing that. Yeah. And that was COVID taking bad, something bad and you know, uh, yep. making raspberry juice. Right? I love it. Okay, so Tyler H6 is asking, Mr. Worman, what was your favorite book or toy when you were little? Oh, Tinker Toys. Tinker Toys. Mm. Yeah, the, the, those ones that you push in, little round things, you push little dowels in and made those. And I had many sets of those. Wow. And I just, I just loved, loved those things. They were the wood things with wood. I think it's called Tinker Toys. Something that has wood things with holes around them and sticks you can put in them. And I built things. And... They could roll some little, had bigger holes. So you could put a, something through that was an axle and make things. And I had big sets of those and just did them all over the room when I did that. Very, it was very architectonic. Wow. That's interesting. Okay. But so I remember that vividly. vividly hmm. doing that. Yeah, that's nice. So now we're, we're jumping up a, a few years. Samantha is uh, 11 and she's asking you, uh, dear Mr. Worman, who living or dead, would you like to have a conversation with and why? Oh, that's a terrific, yeah. uh, terrific question. I was, well, my mentor, the person who changed my life was Lou Kahn, so I would like to have a conversation with him. And and the other man, just I would, the three of us, I think would be great, yeah. would be uh, Skylar Van Rensselaer Kamen, who knew about everything, mathematics and history and spoke 13 languages, had been around the world. I mean, he was an amazing, extraordinary person that nobody knows of. Uh, but I took a number of courses. I took a course and I had permission at the University of Pennsylvania to take as many courses that I wanted in any subject that I wanted, night, day, and Saturdays. And I went to, you know, I, I graduated. Uh, with, I was first in my class. I, mm -hmm. uh, but I took about, uh, I could have gotten three degrees probably, or two or three, at least two degrees. Yeah. Because I took inter-Asian ethnology and technology and Japanese swords, took a lot of courses with Kai Kamen and, wow. and lots of courses in history of art. So I took a whole semester of uh, illuminated pages. So I, I know those up into Mons and to the Gutenberg things. And, and I like illuminated uh, uh, writing very much. And so that's the graphic design in me. And, uh, so that was a gift. It was like, uh, I could go anywhere. It was amazing. It, it was like uh, Google, <laughs> you know, I could only was me doing it and taking courses in it yeah. at, at university. Now every student could do that if they wanted, but they don't ask. Hmm. And another one of my laws is if you don't ask, you don't get. But that's coupled with another one, mathematically coupled, if you, you know, equations. It's equal to, and most things don't work. So if you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah. 
And most things don't work. And you have to accept that. And that gives you power. If I accept the fact that it might not work, I might fail. I might not do it. It gives me power to go ahead. I don't, I'm not stunned by it. I'm, I'm not put off by it. Mm-hmm. It's the nature of things. That in the use, there's something to learn from it not working. So what COVID gave me was sculpture. I couldn't get frames. The failure is not so bad. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I fail a lot. Lots of things don't work. I just, just can't think them out, work them out. I'm passionate about it for a while. I just can't get it to work. Then there's always something else. So, uh, so I'd like to speak to those two. And then I have one that's, that I never met, who is uh, uh, an artist by the name of Paul Clay. I mentioned him before. Mm-hmm. And he was with the Bauhaus. And I would have liked to have met him and talked to him. And he did two amazing books called The Nature of Nature and The Thinking Eye. That were, I have on my shelf. I look at it all the time. And I reference him in my books a lot. So those are three people I'd like to have a conversation with. That's great. I love what you were saying about failure. And I thought, wow, this is a perfect way for this, this conversation to end it, because I think that's a really positive message. Because Well, can we go on past the time and people can just peel off and we can- Yeah, talk? absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So we can. give me another question. Um, so the final question from the kids is from um, Marie, who's age 11. Um, you're not afraid to try new things. How did you get that way? Hmm. Well, I can't answer that because I've always been that way. So I don't know how I got five toes in my foot. Uh, I, I just don't know. Uh, my father was a cigar maker, didn't go to college. Mm-hmm. My mother's family were butchers. They didn't go to college. Yep. My grandfather on that side couldn't read English. Um, he could read Russian and Hebrew. Uh, so I don't have, I'm not on that tree with the golden spoon in my mouth that would take me to where I want. My father encouraged me to do anything that made, that was interesting to me. So he encouraged me. So if I said, can you get me a book on Paul Clay when I was, when my parents didn't know who I was talking about and my teachers at school, even the art teachers didn't know who he was. I mean. He was, nobody knew that then because uh, uh, the, the Bauhaus hadn't really been exposed. Uh, I was born in, in 35. And so I was in school, high school till 53. But in the early 50s and the 40s, <laughs> these things weren't, they were just weren't back in what Computers hadn't been done, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody knew what that was. So, he would find a book, we'd figure out how to find a book on Paul Clay and I'd get it and he wouldn't even open it, he'd never looked at it. But he would indulge me that way. And so I was indulged. And I think indulgence is a good word. I know it's frowned upon. The way when I say uh, being ignorant is frowned upon, failure is frowned upon. Um, and uh, being indulgent is, uh, you know, that's part of us. A, a rich person's thing. No, no, you can indulge yourself by giving yourself permission to be interested in whatever you want to be interested. If you're interested in cars, that's equal to the interest in anything. Yeah. We could take a journey. If somebody, if some kid, 10, 11, 12, was just passionate about cars, as often they are, you could make a whole curriculum for them to choose learn mathematics and physics and chemistry and and design and materials and different languages and the history of movement and the history of of motion and how fast you go and speed everything you can chemistry you can learn anything you want by being interested in cars Mm -hmm. you don't have to learn about mesopotamia you can get to mesopotamia in the history of transportation in those times how, what was transportation like in Egypt? <laughs> why, why in Rome, here's a good one. Why in Rome, you know how far the wheels were apart on a chariot? Mm-hmm. Well, there were five foot eight inches. Duh, that's the width of two horses, right? 
-hmm. How far are the wheels on a train? They're still five foot eight inches. Oh, wow. <laughs> huh. So there's a place you can go with everything. Yeah. See what I did? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I love that. So that's, that's what I did today, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Anything that somebody would ask, ask me, or I ask myself, I will take it to see where it takes me. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my, uh, you know, that's my, my daily journey. And I make a map. A map is man, mankind's ability to perceive. M-A-P. Yeah. Mankind's ability to perceive. Yeah. Everything is basically a map. If you play Monopoly, it's basically a map of a city. So every one of our board games are maps. Mm -hmm. uh, we're mapping everything. We map the human genome. That's what we say. We map it. That's chemistry and physics and math and everything, biology. And we map it. We map so it. I love maps. I know. And I love the idea. And I did a book I was talking about before that sells for a lot of money now called, was published, that was published by MIT Press. So I have had a publishers, a few. Uh, so MIT uh, published that in 1967. And it was called Urban Atlas, 20 American Cities. And uh, it was all hand done. There was no computers. There was no computer mapping or anything. It didn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did this book with a bunch of students at Washington University, St. Louis. And uh, this friend that I spoke about, Jack Dangerman, called me one day. And he called me by my middle name, Saul. And uh, some people do. Uh, Charlie Eames. Uh, Called, called me so I worked with him, worked for him. Um, I worked for only two people who didn't fire me, Lou Kahn and, uh, and Charlie Eames. I got fired from everything else. Um, they just... Okay, oh, I did something they, else, okay. You did it again, okay. So okay. we'll start where we, where we stop. Yeah. So uh, Jack Dangerman called me up and he said, Saul, we have been looking at your book that you did in 67 for quite a while, and we've created a computer program based on what you did by hand. And if you go to your screen, go to your computer, and you mm -hmm. put up there in the bar, Wurman, W-U-R-M-A-N, dots, the whole thing comes up. So you're on a computer, so maybe I'll get, you can't put, put that up and talk on Zoom. But afterwards, just put up worm and dots, and you'll see a whole story about a computer program that Esri now has, named it after that book and me. And that was something done. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't ask them to do it. But they turned it into something completely else that they saw in it that was logical to me in 67 and is logical today with the computers. So there is life after life. Yeah. Um, and so things like that happen, which are fun for me. It's really, that's really nice. And so I think I've always, I've always been afraid of being lost. And I've always wanted a means of, I dream, I dream about finding my way, my dreams, which are not great dreams. They're not terror, there's a little bit of terror, in them, but about not finding my way or knowing a way someplace or having a key to a door. Of, of always doing that. And so my, my, my things are always the struggle to find, find a path. And I don't sometimes, and I do others. But my track record's okay. If I really think about it, many of the things, many of those dreams of finding a path, and I have, although I've published a lot of, there's a lot of books that have come out, there are in my archives just lots of others that I just didn't bother to do because I had figured out how to do it. I mean, if you really figure out how to do something, why do it? And so for me, there's a lot of other things that I have figured out how to do. I have plans for about four, pretty well worked out for four different gatherings that are as special as anything I've done yet. But I'll never do them, but I figured it out because I'm thinking about them, so I figured them out. 
Yeah, you said to me um, when you were talking about that, that anything is possible if you have the time. And then you, you talked about Stephen Wright. Everything is in walking distance if you have the time. Ah, that's right. I love that. Well, you go, St uh, uh, Wright, Stephen Wright, uh, who does these one-liners. Yeah. Has a, a great one-liner is uh, that one, if you have enough time. If you, everything is in walking distance if you have enough time. Yeah. It's a joke. Now, why is it a joke? Because it's the opposite of expectation. The punchline is the opposite of expectation. It's a radical alternative. It's creative. It's what you're trying to do to create things is have alternatives and things that are not what you're doing, how to make something clearer. And it's not just a better version of what you're doing. It's something that's a flip or something radically different. It's not just putting that camera on the back of a, you can't, if you do an advertising campaign for a car and you say they're innovative because they have a camera on the back of their car, that's not really innovation. It's like putting a stamp on an envelope. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it doesn't pass the test. Right? Yeah. You don't get a medal for that. So, uh, but I have some different ways of doing uh, gatherings, often based on conversation, but on different ways of setting them up that I think are better than what I've done in the past. I don't think I'll get to do them. <laughs> but uh, I think about them, and I have pleasure that I've worked it out. And they're not for somebody else to do. It's just, you can think of something and just do it. And uh, I'm, still, I'm still doing that. I, I suspect I'm at 90, the dribble will come down my chin and I'll either either I'll be dead or I'll some of the cranks will move my head. I forget some common words now, but I don't forget concepts and I don't forget new ideas. That's still working. And that's an interesting thing that I'm learning about, which is aging and learning about what that is and what is improved with aging of how you think and how you get some of the you're easier to get some of the cobways or off of an idea and what isn't. So it's, it's all, it's, I'm trying to suck it dry if I can and yeah. get as much out of it as I can. Yeah. Doesn't make me more patient. Yeah, but it's, it's just. Does Hillary have a question? You still there, Hillary? Hillary is still there. Oh. And there's also, there's a comment here um, from a Lynn Hi Brooks. guys, still here. Doing just, great. This has been phenomenally entertaining and interesting. Do have, do have, well, do you, have a, do you have a question? Not really. I'm just very really inspired right. by everything just you said. Off, so cut keep it off. going. Cut her off. Cut her off. <laughs> but you know what? I do have a comment um, from a Lynn Brooks who put it in our little Q&A box. And she says, greetings. I live, work, and learn in the area called Vancouver, Canada, within the territories of Mesquim, Squamish. And I'm, I'm sorry, Lynn, that I'm mispronouncing this because these are unfamiliar words to me. Uh, um, Tile Watututh Nations. And she says, appreciate your action and impact. You are answering my query as you speak. But do you have a particular encouragement we elder persons sharing, contributing their ongoing wisdoms? And then she puts understanding and then misunderstanding in front of in brackets, um, uh, misunderstanding journey. Cheers. Well, I also, I would like to know from her if she were the Kwakiutl Indians are. Uh, I know you can't use the word Indians, but I'm used to using it. I apologize. Mm -hmm. uh, Kwakiutl indigenous people, I guess you have to say. Because uh, they were they were interesting. They have the best totem poles, and some of the best blankets, and they invented the the whole the social interaction of potlatch. Where you've heard the word potlatch? Yeah. No. Yes. Yeah, no. You know what a potlatch is? No. I've heard of the word, but I don't know what it is. But I've heard of it. Well, people, wealthy people would sit around. All the wealthy people in the tribe, they'd sit around the families. And oh, they by the way, yeah, uh, Lynn says yes to your question. She's still on, so she says yes. Oh, so they know the she knows the Kwaki Oodle. Oh, great. Okay. Yes, thanks, Lynn. Uh, and they would sit around and they would throw the blankets, which were very hard to make, and took you know months and months to weave a blanket or something else. They throw it on the fire, and they say, "I'm that rich. 
I could throw that away. <laughs> and then somebody else would throw that many blankets plus one to beat them. And that's the idea of potlatch, of beating somebody by willing to destroy your wealth in front of them. It's a way of bragging. And But they also did, for, I think they did very good totem poles up there. And there was something I was interested. I took a course in, in, uh, in indigenous people when I went to Penn, when I was telling you I could take any course I want. And I did a semester of uh, the Inuit on the Inuit. So very nice. Uh, and that's, but they're not the Inuit, but that's why I know that the Kwaki Oodles were interesting to me. I and mean, I like the connection between that and everything else in my life. Right. Yeah. So. Thank you, Lynn. That's so nice. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. But so, you can, why don't you ask me something that you're interested in? Why don't you go on that journey? Yeah. I, d um, hmm. I mean, there's, the, what do I want to ask you? Give me a second. I'm, I'm, I want, I want to, I really want to think about this. Cause I mean, I've, I've obviously, I've asked you these a whale, questions. A whale, right? a whale baby weighs 8,800 pounds. A whale baby, 8,800 pounds. That's like it's four like or five Cadillacs. Yeah. <laughs> Full buses. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do first thing in the morning when you wake up? Uh, I don't have any exact routine, but often I'll sit in a, a chair, one of those massage chairs with my iPhone and look at uh, all the messages from overnight and late the night before. Mm -hmm. And I'll answer some things and send some messages out and try to clean out my uh, my uh, my uh, uh, emails and texts. And then I go about uh, getting dressed and I always wear pajamas. So I just have a shelf of pajamas. I wear pajamas I get from going first class on airplanes yeah. overseas. So I have a lot of pajamas. I put on a pair of pajamas. And for this thing, I put on a little scarf that's a nice scarf because I'm, I'm dressed up now. I don't wear this. I wear this because we're doing this showbiz thing. And, uh, and then I go downstairs and have coffee that's already made because uh, the person who runs our house uh, comes in at uh, 6.42 uh, every morning. That's just when she comes in. And um, I see it on my yes, iPhone. Yes, 6.42. Oh, yeah, it goes bang because our our uh, alarm system goes off. She turns it off, you know, the 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 arms, the arms, and then and I will come down and have a uh, coffee, which is uh, already has hot milk in it, and sit in the kitchen and look at the couple newspapers, and until my wife comes down. Now that's not specifically. Sometimes I don't come down till one, because I go down the hall to my studio. And yeah. I don't make it downstairs. So it's not. It's yeah, it's not, not the same every but day. Sometimes I have a very bad, bad night sleeping, so I stay in bed long. Yeah, because you had a it's nightmare. Very, I have a very free, free something. A, I'm not going to a job and I don't compute, so commute. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's my, my daily life is like every day. It's, for instance, we have, we have work and play. That's a notion we have, right? Work, yeah. play. We work on vacation. We save these days for vacation. But what is a vacation? A vacation is something of your choice. You're doing something you really want to do because you choose it. You pay yeah. for it. What if you can do what you want to do every day? Then every day is vacation. Well, I do what I want to do every day. <laughs> so it depends on how you define the words. Yeah. Okay. I don't have family money. No, everything I know, everything you've done, you've done your own merit. Ah, excellent. That's just, it's, 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 I don't understand it quite. It's been, it's been a surprise. It's been a good ride. Well, it's reasonable. Reasonable. I just got a pop up uh, chat question. Hillary has a question. So I'm going to, Hillary, Go join us. <laughs> she has a question. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was a little caught off guard. I was just so intently listening. But in in Richard, in what you just said about you don't really have the separation between vacation and life and every, you do well, everything life, that you love. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. And I, I share that in yeah. terms of 
you know, just the tremendous opportunity to get to create all the time is there's no separation, but in, in your ongoing journey, when and where are you, or were you most productive and creative? Was there a specific time in your life or does it all kind of, has it all been one continuous journey? Oh, that's a question. That's an interesting question. And uh, there is a, a young man uh, named Dan Klein, uh, K-L-Y-N, the Dutch Klein, not the Jewish Klein, K-L-Y-N, mm -hmm. uh, who was, uh, in the, was in the process of doing a biography on me and has collected my archives and everything. So there's a timeline that shows yeah. year by year what came out. So I didn't, I, I think my first uh, actual books were until 62 when I was 25. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think my first things came out when I was 25. So I started mm -hmm. on this thing when I was 25 and then every year I did at least one book or more, two or three. Something. So, but I did that fairly regularly. Then they've dropped off in the last few years. I've done that very big book that she has, which was, yeah. uh, and the, la the last book I did was called no, the, the, not the last book. The, sec the next book I did was called Mortality. It's a book about death. Uh, and uh, I think she has one there. And you can't get it at all. It was never sold. It's a book, but the whole book is about death. And uh, uh, it's, I think it's a nice book. And uh, it was, we printed, uh, printed 21,000 copies. And then it was given away at a conference of 21,000 people. So never got to the bookstores or to Amazon. Yeah. Some of those 21,000 people sell it on eBay, so you can get it, you can always find a copy. Yeah. But it's not on Amazon, just, you, can, you can find it, but it was never in bookstores or anything. Um, that, then after that, the last book I did just came out this last year, this year, beginning of this year, I guess, which, uh, I had done a book in 1962 when I was 25. And it was, uh, it was a book on Lou Kahn, who had been speaking about. Mm -hmm. And I was young. And I asked him, could I do a book because I wanted a piece of him by my bed, metaphorically, so I could right. read some things he said and some of his sketches because he was really part of my DNA. I mean, really part of my life, a major part of my life my way of thinking, not stylistically, not in this personal life of how he lived, but I mean, we had a personal life together because we went to baseball games and football games uh, sometimes, mm -hmm. which I couldn't talk about because I was working in his office and it was very competitive. So it couldn't look like we, we were friends. Um, and uh, somebody came to me and said, this book you did called The Notebooks and Drawings of Lewis Icahn when you were quite young, we would like to reprint because it's long out of print. I mean, I think about a thousand or 2000 were printed and that's, that's it, it's ever reprinted. Mm -hmm. So uh, I finally said, yes, if I could do a companion volume to it, which turned out to the same size of it uh, called the uh, Profound Scrapbook. And I did a scrapbook of stuff that nobody would ever publish on Lou and pictures of him and stories from his children about him, stories Lou, things from other architects, great architects in the world. And uh, a few, well, just a couple of essays, two or three essays from the people who run the archives of Lucan at Penn, University of Pennsylvania. And it's a big, it's a, it's a big book. And, the, and it's the same size as the other book, which was a big book. And uh, so that's the last thing I did. And I like doing that. It came out better than I thought. Some things don't. <laughs> uh, but this came out better than I thought. And that was uh, Steve Croder, whose passion about reprinting books that are out of print made him do a Kickstarter on it. And, uh, and they got the help of, of one of Yale University's presses. Uh, there, they have two presses, a major press and one with the British Museum of Art at, at Yale that Lucan designed. And it came out and uh, it, that's the last thing I did. So it's trailed off, but uh, 
but there's things I talk about sculptures. There's a I'm passionate mm -hmm. about it. I'm working on there's one I there's two I took to the I collected from the uh, yes two days ago and two I dropped off to be to be made mm -hmm. and that was just uh, recently. So I'm still doing some sculpture. I've stopped owning I think for a while, mm -hmm. and I'm not working on. There's one book I might be working on, but I. I'm not really working on any books right now, but I might. So your creativity and your productivity has just carried with you from the inside out, not based on your environment. A lot of people, you know, I myself included, have you know recently moved from being in one place for a long time to another, and so no, people have moved. Have no, no, yeah, I moved. their environment. I spent a lot of my life in Philly, and then I mm -hmm. went to uh, 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 California. I had stints at Cambridge. University uh, mm -hmm. teaching and uh, and University of North Carolina and Raleigh and lived there for two years, uh, but I always I've always done things in different places. Then I lived in L.A. for a while, uh, for about uh, eight years. Lived in New York uh, for about eight years. Lived in Newport, Rhode Island for about twenty years, and then moved down here about eight years ago. Uh, and uh, so. I mean, I had a large house in Newport, very large house, mm -hmm. and had eight acres, and I designed all the gardens there, and there were gardens and swimming pools. I did three swimming pools, uh, uh, two outdoor pools and one indoor pool, because my wife likes to swim, and all kinds of formal and informal gardens, and uh, a maze, uh, actually, well, it wasn't a maze, it was, what's the other word? I'll think of it in a minute. See, that's what's being old. I can't think of the other world you use. It's not a maze. A maze you can get lost in, and the other one, what's the other word? It looks like a maze, but you there's only one way of going through. I'll think of it. Um, and uh, so, no, I've done things wherever I've been and down here. It's, uh, as I told you, got changed by COVID, but uh, it, it'll drop off for sure. I think I do less now. I don't, I don't think I produce as many things now. So I think as you get really old, long in the tooth, you, you stop doing some things. Richard, what's an acre? A lot of people think I'm dead. What's an acre? Uh, okay. That was one of my first examples I used on people when I started information architecture. I said, if I asked you what an acre is, which is a very common word because people buy houses and that they're at the advertisements at a half an acre, a quarter of an acre, two acres, one acre. And then they don't know what an acre is, but they learn what an acre is in school, and it's 43,560 square feet. But you don't remember that. Right. And you can't visualize 43,560 square feet. I mean, how do you visualize 43,500 square feet? Well, yeah. about the size of an American football field. Mm -hmm. That's American football, uh, not the rest of the world's football, American football without the end zones. And that's just about the size of an acre. Yeah. We've, you, you've shared that with me before, but it was funny, David um, Gallo put that in the Q&A, which is great, thanks, David. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> yeah. David Gallo. That's David, yeah. Those people who watch TED Talks know David Gallo. He's one of the best known TED speakers and he spoke, he's one of the people who were involved in the initial things with the uh, Titanic. And he was, was with Woods Hole, and now he does a lot of consulting and all kinds of others. A great speaker. A little loopy kind of guy, but I really like him, and uh, I know he'll hear this call out. And get he's on. <laughs> oh, I know he's on. He's on. <laughs> so, oh my gosh! Yeah, he's one of my one of my buds. Yeah, thanks for that, David. Richard, I have to wrap it up because I have. Uh, I have, you have something to do. That. Okay. I do. Well, yeah. I, I, thank I, you very I, much. If some anybody wants to email me, they can email me. It's easy to find somebody's email if you want. Yeah. So I'm not giving away personal things because you can't find my house that way but you anybody can find anybody's house too if uh, they want to better not come but we have a gated community so we won't get far yeah uh, it's rsw at worman w-u-r-m-a-n.com perfect and if somebody wants to write me something i don't promise you i'll answer you but i might uh, uh it seems interesting that's great Richard, thanks so yeah, much. Yeah, some old shoes you want to give me, that'd be fine. Oh, okay. What size are you? Nine. <laughs> Nine, okay. <laughs> that was so much fun. And I'm I'm going to, well, we always take our conversation. This is the first time we've had our conversation online like this. So thank you. 
That was okay. wonderful. And right. uh, yes, thank you. It was in absolutely incredible potpourri of information and insights, so and we really time, appreciate I, it. I, I I can take I can talk, and I have done talks. Uh, at I remember one night I gave a talk for the people at Brown and the students, no faculty, because mm -hmm. faculty don't like me, but the students. <laughs> Uh, uh, at Brown and RISD put me on one night mm -hmm. and I just stood up there and uh, for two hours and then finally stopped and uh, didn't lose too many people I couldn't do it now for two hours because I'd have to pee in an hour yeah but, uh, right. <laughs> I could do two one hour speeches yeah I need a break <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah for sure but that was great. Thank you so much for sharing all your insight. And I, I just wanted our community to get a better understanding of what you're about. And that was really helpful. So thanks for that. And now I'm going to, I'm going to turn off my camera cause I'm going to pass it over to Hillary, but um, I'll talk to you soon, Richard. Okay, dokie. All right. See you later. Hey, thank you. See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Hi everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us. That was incredibly insightful, information-packed conversation. We hope you enjoyed every minute of it and have lots of questions to follow up with. Just a few closing announcements. Um, Cabo returns um, in February, 2023. We will be back in Cabo, um, which is going to be an incredible experience, February 2nd through 5th, 2023. Um, more information will be sent out shortly and often. We're also continuing our Gift of Sight campaign. If you haven't yet participated, please help us achieve our goal of providing 1,000 more sight-saving surgeries. Please go to Genius100Visions.com and donate. For every $125 raised, a surgery can be performed and you can help save someone's vision. Our next Genius Up will be on Thursday, November 17th, where we will feature Genius 100 Visionary and Waze co-founder, Yuri Levy, in what's sure to be a fascinating conversation with Ambassador Ido Aharoni. For those of you in the Miami area, this Sunday, October 24th, is the season opener of the Miami Symphony Orchestra, led by our dear friend and Genius 100 visionary, Eduardo Martoret. Last I checked, a few tickets were still available. If you enjoy our programming, please consider hopping onto our website and donate. For more information about our campaigns and activities, please go to our website, www.genius100visions.com, join our mailing list, or just be in touch anytime via email with either myself or Helen. Thank you again, Richard and Helen, and we'll see you next time.